Audiobook title, I Have Become the Child Emperor, 01-13, by Support underscore 5. This work belongs to author, Support underscore 5. Source, Scribblehub.com. Chapter 1. Hee hee, so many delicious foods to eat. I can't get enough of it, said the overweight man. He ate with such fervor that it seemed as if he hadn't eaten in days. On the table in front of him were various delicacies including poultry, beef, pork, seafood, and desserts. Despite the empire being in a state of recession, the man was still able to feast to his heart's content. He was none other than the secret ruler of the empire, Prime Minister Honest. Ever since he was young, he had desired a life of luxury, filled with women, food, and power. He had taken control of the empire a few years ago by cunningly poisoning the previous emperor and empress. This is good. Give me more of this. Honest exclaimed, throwing his plate at a maid in the corner. Ah. The maid cried out in pain as the plate hit her head, causing her to bleed. The girl was shaking, clearly afraid, as she obeyed the prime minister's command. Honest was amused at the thought that such a delicate girl could be found in the capital. The girl was a slave, procured by the Kobor brothers from the capital's slums. She had a petite frame, accentuating her delicate features, with a heart-shaped face, rosy cheeks, small lips, and her hair was kept in place with a maid's cap. The girl's beauty couldn't be hidden despite the deep fear she was showing. In fact, Honest found the look amusing. The girl was young, the Kobor brothers mentioned that she was 15 years old and untouched, a delicious fruit to be tasted. Don't use anything but your hands, the prime minister commanded. The girl hesitated but complied, her fear making her hands shake uncontrollably as she picked up the shattered plates. In her haste, she didn't notice the small cuts forming on her palms. Tears welled up in her eyes as she continued to clean up the mess. Despite her best efforts to be careful, the prime minister watched with a smirk as she struggled to complete the task to his satisfaction. Oh dear, look at you. Did you ever imagine your life would turn out like this? Honest asked, walking towards the girl while still gnawing on the turkey leg in his hand. The girl remained silent, her sobs muffled as she continued to pick up the shards of broken plates. Such is life. In order for some to enjoy it, others must suffer. And unfortunately, your lot is to suffer, Honest continued bending his knee and lifting the girl's chin. Tell me girl, do you hate your parents? Honest asked, with a monstrous grin. They did this to you, didn't they? They couldn't pay the loan they took, causing you to suffer. You must despise them greatly. The girl gave no response and bit her lower lip, her eyes filled with fear. The prime minister could clearly see her distress, and it brought him deep satisfaction. He enjoyed the power he held over her, relishing in the control he had over someone so helpless. Ha 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 ha. I will enjoy breaking you. By the end of the night, you will hate your parents to your very core. Honest declared, removing his belt. It had been a few days since he last had his released and he figured the girl would suffice. No. Please and no. The girl cried out, backing away from Honest in fear. The minister's laughter sends shivers down the girl's spine. She was young but she wasn't stupid. When you grow up in the slums of the capital you get to know things, things that no girl should go through. With tears streaming down her face and blood dripping from her head, she begged for mercy. Now, now girl, we are, Honest was interrupted by a guard who suddenly burst into the room. Prime Minister something has happened. Come quickly. The palace guard shouted with a sense of urgency. He quickly scanned the room and saw the girl bleeding and crying in the corner and the minister about to remove his belt. For a brief moment he paused but decided to put it at the back of his mind due to the urgency of the situation. With anger blazing in his eyes, Prime Minister Honest bellowed, What in the world do you want? Can't you see I'm busy? Can't General Budo control his soldiers? The soldier remained unruffled by the Prime Minister's outburst. With the powerful General Budo behind him, he had no reason to fear the Prime Minister. Emperor Makoto has lost consciousness, the guard reported. General Budo has heightened the palace security and ordered all necessary individuals to gather in the Emperor's quarters without delay. I have been instructed to escort you there immediately. What? You should have told me that right away, you imbecile. The prime minister exclaimed, quickly fastening his belt. Before he left his chambers, he instructed the girl to tidy his room. As the girl watched the prime minister depart, she was momentarily relieved. She knew that this small reprieve would last only a few hours at most. She never envisioned her life turning out like this. She used to dream of a better future. It was her idea for her parents to take out a loan. She and her mother were skilled cooks, and they thought they could improve their lives by selling sweets. All they ever wanted was to earn a decent income and escape the slums, to have a better life. But now, her dreams lay shattered like the broken plates at her feet, and she was left with only the pain of her reality. Her parents were killed, 
and now she was about to be violated by the Prime Minister. She gazed longingly at the lavish feast the Prime Minister had left behind. All that food could have sustained her family for days. The girl only wanted a better life, one worth living. A life where she wouldn't have to worry about the next meal or struggle to make ends meet. Now, as she looked at the abundance of food on the table, she couldn't help but feel a pang of bitterness and resentment towards those who lived a life of luxury without a care in the world. Despite her anger, she knew she was powerless. She was just a little girl, unfortunate enough to have a dream. Her eyes fell to the floor, and she picked up a piece of the shattered plate. I'm sorry, Mama, Papa, she wept. If only I hadn't. I could never hate you. I love you. Her parents had passed away only a few days ago, and she still vividly remembered the terror on their faces as they were murdered. With a heavy heart and despair, she clutched the jagged piece of plate. She hesitated for only a moment before driving the sharp edges into her skin. Tears streamed down her face as she repeated the motion, carving two lines of crimson into her flesh. The blood flowed freely as she surrendered to the darkness, her breaths growing shallow until they finally stopped. I'm sorry, Mama, Papa. I should never have dreamed. 3. Chapter 2 General Budo stood at the doorway of the Emperor's chamber, his heart pounding in his chest as he took in the sight before him. The child Emperor, whom he had taken an oath to protect at all costs, lay still, pale on his bed, and had rough breathing. Multiple physicians were frantically trying to wake him but to no avail. What happened? Budo asked the physician, his voice tight with anger. I don't know, the head physician replied, shaking his head. He just suddenly collapsed and now he's spiking a fever. There's no apparent cause for it, no injuries or illnesses that I can find. It is a complete mystery. Budo's mind immediately raced to the possibility of foul play. He suspected an assassination attempt on the child emperor, and he wouldn't rest until he figured out what had happened. Is it poison? Budo asked the physician, his eyes hard. I can't rule it out, but I'm not certain, the head physician replied after a moment of silence, fear evident in his voice. You will do everything in your power to cure the emperor, or I will make sure you die a painful death, Budo threatened as his eyes scanned all the physicians in the room. Yes, of course, the physician replied, his voice shaking. He immediately told his colleagues to continue working, now with heightened effort. Budo turned his attention to the guards in the room, and he realized they were not the usual palace guards. He had no doubt they were the prime minister's men, a fact that only added to his anger. He had been tasked with protecting the palace and the emperor, yet it seemed the emperor had favored the prime minister over him. I want the palace sealed off and a full investigation launched, Budo ordered. No one leaves until we figure out what happened to the emperor. I want all aerial danger beasts in flight now. The capital's airspace is in lockdown. Order the capital guards to close all the gates. Search the palace and question everyone who had been near the child emperor when he collapsed. Contact my lieutenants and tell them to increase the troops stationed within the palace and immediately place checkpoints at various locations within the capital. Yes sir. The guards replied in unison. Despite Budo not being their direct superior, the guards realized the dire situation and immediately did as they were told. Just as Budo was about to turn his attention back to the emperor, the door to the chamber burst open and Prime Minister Honest rushed in, feigning concern. What's happened? Is the emperor all right? Prime Minister Honest asked, his eyes darting around the room. He couldn't help but notice the soldiers that General Budo had ordered. It was clear to him that Budo was trying to regain control of the palace, and it irked Honest greatly. He had worked hard to install his own guards close to the emperor and make leeway within the palace grounds. But the sudden event of the child emperor collapsing had taken all that effort away. Despite his frustration, he knew he couldn't show it on his face. He needed to play the part of a concerned minister after all. Budo felt a wave of disgust wash over him as he took in the sight of the prime minister. He knew that Honest was not to be trusted, that the corruption that had taken root in the empire was a direct result of the man's evil nature. The emperor has collapsed, Budo said tersely. We're still trying to determine the cause. Oh dear, this is terrible news, Honest stated, shaking his head dramatically. Is there anything I can do to help? Budo wanted to accuse Honest of being behind the emperor's collapse, but he knew he had to keep his emotions in check. He couldn't let the heads of politics clash with the heads of the military, not if he wanted to protect the empire. Besides, he wasn't sure if Honest was responsible for the sudden illness of the emperor. Killing the emperor would give Honest very little or no value at all. And if he kills Honest now, he might just be removed from his position by the other ministers, who would no doubt exert all the authority they can use now that the emperor was sick. He didn't want that outcome. No, we've got everything under control, Budo replied, his voice cold. At this moment, the capital is in martial law. 
Honest nodded, but Budo could see the calculation in his eyes. He knew he needed to be careful, to keep his eyes and ears open and not let the Prime Minister get the better of him. The guards a few moments ago gave him a wake-up call. I see, that's an appropriate response, Honest replied as his eyes lingered towards the doctors trying to cure the Emperor. Hmm. I will place the four Rakshasa within the palace to guard the E. Before Honest could continue speaking Budo shouted with anger lace in his voice, you will not have those executioners come near the Emperor. I will personally protect and station my soldiers close to the Emperor. Honest, who had been interrupted, stared at Budo's furious eyes and spoke with a serious tone. As the main general in charge of protecting the capital, if it were discovered that the emperor was targeted for assassination, it would reflect poorly on your duties. You would do well to remember that, Grand General Budo. Honest's words hung in the air, heavy with implication. Budo felt a twinge of anger, but he knew that Honest was right. He needed to be more vigilant in his duties, especially during a time of political unrest with rebellions popping up throughout the empire. With a deep breath, he nodded his agreement. Understood, Prime Minister, Budo replied, his voice firm. I will do everything in my power to ensure the safety of the capital and the emperor, he emphasized, making it clear that the emperor's safety was his top priority. Honest nodded, I know you will, Grand General. We all must do our part to protect the empire in these troubled times. I will meet with the other ministers and tell them what has occurred, Honest said as he left the room. As Honest departed from the chambers, Budo turned his attention back to the child emperor, whose well-being was a source of great concern. He couldn't bear the thought of the young ruler's untimely death. The emperor was the last remaining heir to the imperial line, and if he were to pass away, the empire would be thrown into a precarious state. Not only would the rebel forces become even more emboldened, but it was possible that the various regions of the empire would secede and declare independence, breaking apart the once great nation. As the physician worked diligently, Budo made a silent vow to use all his resources and power to uncover the truth behind the emperor's illness. If anyone had dared to plot the emperor's assassination, they would soon feel the full force of Budo's wrath as the grand general of the empire. 5. Chapter 3. Ah. That hit the spot. Leon stated as she took a large gulp of beer with a smile on her face. Today was a supplies run day, and she had been tasked by Nagenda to gather supplies for the base of Night Raid. As one of the few members of the group who was not in the wanted list, Leon was the perfect person for the job. What Nagenda didn't know was that every time she gave Leon some money, Leon would also take some for herself to enjoy in the capital. Drinking beer or gambling some money away was her vice. Most of the time, she would spend half the money, resulting in her stealing most of the supplies they needed. With her animalistic instincts, she had yet to be caught. Sometimes she would use her sex appeal to get some stuff for free. It can be simple when you make your breasts bounce, Leon thought with a huge grin on her face. I win. No. You cheated. Money. 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 Ha 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 ha. Leon gave a boisterous laugh as she looked at the table beside her. Two men, already drunk, were arguing over a small amount of coins. Hey, Leon. Go out with me. A man shouted as he approached her. With amusement on her face, Leon replied, only if you buy me enough drinks to get drunk. Ha. I'll probably have to sell my house just to provide one night of alcohol for you, the man replied sarcastically. Most likely, Leon thought as she scanned the room. She recognized most of the patrons. She had known many of them even before she joined the Revolutionary Army. They were all good people who deserved a better life in the new empire, once the Revolutionary Army succeeds in taking out the Prime Minister. She took another sip of her beer, until she caught sight of a woman in the corner of her eye. Leon paid her tab, said goodbye to the others at the bar, and followed the woman into an alley. Any new hits? She asked the woman. I'm getting bored doing nothing lately. A few, honestly. I'll let you and your team decide which one you like, or if you want to take them all. As far as I can tell, all those people in the list deserve to be taken care of, the woman, Annie, replied as she handed Leon a stack of papers. Thanks, Annie, Leon answered. The woman in front of her was a revolutionary spy within the capital, named Annie. There are most likely dozens if not hundreds of spies within the capital, all of which have various duties. Oftentimes the job of Annie was to act as a middleman for night raid. It was a very dangerous job that required at most discretion, secrecy, and quick thinking. Any misstep could lead to her capture and the exposure of night raids operations, putting the entire revolution at risk. Annie knew the stakes and took her duty seriously, always careful to cover her tracks and maintain her cover identity. Her service to the cause was invaluable, and Leon couldn't help but feel a sense of admiration and gratitude toward her fellow revolutionary. 
Leon scanned the list of targets that Annie had given her, knowing that each one of them had done terrible things to innocent people. They were the embodiment of the corrupt and rotten system that the revolutionary forces were fighting against. Night Raid are assassins after all, which means they could be hired, under the right circumstances at least. As long as the target is a scum of society, then they would be eliminated, no questions asked. This is how Night Raid officially gets their funding. While the main revolutionary forces have allied themselves with the various kingdoms and tribes outside of the empire, Night Raid gets a chunk of their income by eliminating individuals that the ordinary people had enough of. I'll tell Nagenda about this. It's been a while since the gang had some action. Yeah, we're still finalizing some targets that the revolutionary army wants taken care of. For now, you guys can take out some commission jobs. Thanks again, Annie. See you. Before Leon could finish talking a man came running towards them, both Leon and the woman recognized him as Ben, a fellow revolutionary spy. What are you doing here out in the open? Annie stated in frustration. Something extremely important came up. The man stated with heavy breathing. Ben was in charge of communication between spies inside the capital. He was from a clan that tames danger beasts. His speciality was taming rodent-type danger beasts. The rebel forces used these rodents to deliver messages between each other. It is an incredibly handy skill to have. It allowed the revolutionary spies to communicate discreetly with one another. Our contacts in the palace said that the child emperor has collapsed. They say it could be an assassination attempt. General Budo is taking full command of the capital as we speak, is said to be enacting martial law. What? Annie replied in shock. She glanced at Leon to try and see her reaction. Hey, don't look at me like that. I have no idea about this, Leon replied defensively. As far as Leon knew, they didn't have any targets for the day, let alone the week. Besides assassinating the emperor was suicide. He was undoubtedly the most well-protected child in the world. The palace is rigged with traps and it was where Grand General Budo was staying. Attacking that place is a one-way trip you don't come back from. Roar. Roar. Just then, roars filled the air as danger beasts, giant creatures controlled by the empire, approached the capital. The most common ones in the pact were wyvern-type danger beast. All of them were several stories tall and they were all ready to kill anyone that comes near them. Leon's heart raced as she watched the beasts draw closer. Shit, Budo means business, she muttered, feeling the sweat drip down her forehead. The aerial danger beast of the empire. All of them usually hover way above the clouds and are only called upon when needed. This is getting dangerous, Ben stated. Leon, you need to leave quickly. No doubt Budo will make sure to close the capital and begin his investigation. Budo thinks that someone has assassinated the emperor. He will be out for blood. You need to tell this to Nagenda, and you might need to lay low for a while. Continuing with the commission jobs would be a foolish idea for now, and he stated to Leon. Yeah I know, Leon sighed. Oh well, at least Nagenda would like to hear this information anyway, Leon stated as he slapped Ben's back and said, thanks for telling me the intel Ben. I don't want to stay here when Budo goes wild. How about you guys, what are you going to do for the time being? Leon continued. You don't have to worry about that. Before I went to find you, I sent out all my rodents giving a message to every single revolutionary spy to remain hidden for a while, Ben replied. Well, it looks like we won't be finding any action anytime soon, Leon stated as she activated her taigu, which gave her animalistic features. She started jumping from roof to roof, making her way towards the capital gates as quickly as she could. 6. Chapter 4 A woman with striking features, short silver hair, and piercing purple eyes sat smoking a cigarette by her window. Her black suit hugged her curves, revealing her cleavage, and an eye patch covered her right eye. But what truly stood out was her metallic right arm, which she used to hold her cigarette. This woman was Nagenda, the former general of the empire, who had defected to the rebel forces and was now the leader of the elite assassination unit, Night Raid. As she gazed out the window, Nagenda couldn't help but mutter to herself, what a headache. The news of the child emperor's collapse had caused quite a stir throughout the empire. After receiving the news, the revolutionary headquarters held a meeting to discuss the collapse of the child emperor. They concluded that no members of the rebel forces were responsible for the monarch's collapse. They decided to temporarily delay any further operations and adopt a wait-and-see approach. They wanted to figure out what the empire would do and react accordingly. However, a few days later, additional information arrived at the revolutionary headquarters. According to the doctors, the child emperor collapsed due to his own failing health and was now in a coma. Nagenda was annoyed and questioned the authenticity of the information. 
It was said to have come from a revolutionary member within the capital, but Leon had informed her that Ben had ordered the rebel forces inside the capital to lay low. The information had passed through multiple checkpoints without being discovered. This alone had given her great suspicion. She couldn't believe that Budo, the empire's great general, could be so lax with his soldiers that he would allow such information to be released. For fear of being discovered, Nagenda had not ordered Leon to return to the capital yet. She could only hope that after the lockdowns were lifted, the revolutionary members within the capital were safe and sound. Deep beneath the capital, in a damp, dimly lit room, the sickening stench of blood and burnt flesh hung heavily in the air. The flicker of multiple torches cast eerie shadows on the walls, illuminating the grotesque sight of multiple bodies piled together in a corner. Each body had multiple burn marks on different parts, some missing limbs with exposed bones, and others with gaping wounds that oozed blood onto the stone floor. Suddenly, a heart-wrenching scream pierced through the stillness of the room, followed by the sound of chains clanking. A woman hung in the air, her limbs chained to the walls, preventing her from convulsing uncontrollably. Multiple burnt marks and bruises covered her body, a clear sign of prolonged torture. Her face was barely recognizable, covered in wounds and with only her right eye slightly open. As General Budo stepped forward, his cold eyes locked onto the woman, and he spoke with a hard and unforgiving voice, Tell me, who else are your fellow rebels? The woman being tortured was none other than Annie, the latest spy captured within the walls of the capital. General Budo stood in front of Annie with a scowl on his face. He had always despised the rebel forces and their constant interference with the empire's affairs. So, when the opportunity to capture their spies presented itself, he did not hesitate. General Budo had purposely leaked the information about the child emperor's current coma diagnosis. He wanted to lure out some rebel forces and someone naive took the bait. The rebel spy was captured once the information was released. It was something Budo was willing to do. Besides, he doubts that he could keep the information about the emperor's coma for long. Even at this moment, multiple ministers had started using their power to try and lift the martial law that he had enacted. Unfortunately, this led to Annie's current predicament. After capturing one spy, it led to the capture of another until eventually, they reached her. Seeing the number of spies captured made Budo angry beyond measure, and it eventually led to him taking charge of Annie's interrogation process. As he stood in front of Annie, Budo's fist was stained with blood, a testament to the brutal tactics he employed during the interrogation. Despite her injuries, Annie remained defiant, refusing to divulge any information about her fellow rebels. Her courage only seemed to anger Budo further, and he resolved to break her will no matter the cost. Annie's voice emerged in ragged gasps, the effort of speaking causing her great pain. Despite this, she fixed General Budo with a fierce stare, determined to confront him. How does it feel, General, she challenged, her words dripping with sarcasm, to be unable to protect the emperor due to his own health failing him. You must feel incredibly useless. Her voice was low and measured, with a hint of a smirk marking her face. Annie continued to hold Budo's gaze, her remaining eye glinting with a mix of pain, anger, and perhaps enjoyment. She refused to look away, even as she sensed the irritation emanating from the general. Budo's brow furrowed, and his jaw tightened visibly, betraying his anger. Annie's question had clearly struck a nerve, but she remained unafraid and determined to stand her ground. He had been struggling to come to terms with the emperor's illness, feeling helpless and frustrated at his inability to protect the ruler. Annie's barbs only served to stoke the flames of his inner turmoil. Annie's chest heaved as she struggled to catch her breath. You talk about honor, duty, and loyalty to the empire, but where is it now? She spat, her voice dripping with venom. The people suffer under the weight of corrupt officials who abuse their power without consequence. How can you call yourself a protector of the empire when you stand idly by and watch as it crumbles before your very eyes? Her words echoed through the room, punctuated only by her labored breathing. You and the other officials have failed us, General Budo, she continued, her voice shaking with anger. You've allowed greed and power to rule the empire, and now it's rotting from the inside out. Budo's face darkened at the accusations, his jaw clenching tightly as he prepared to respond. But before he could utter a word, Annie cut him off. And don't you dare try to lecture me about rebellion, she spat, her voice laced with contempt. We're fighting for a better future, for a nation where justice and righteousness are more than just empty words. And if that means taking down those who stand in our way, then so be it. Budo's expression hardened, his eyes narrowing as he fixed Annie with a steely gaze. You speak of justice and righteousness, but you are blinded by your own narrow-mindedness, he retorted. Suddenly, despite the pain racking her body, Annie began to laugh uncontrollably. A harsh and bitter sound echoed through the room. The emperor's failing health is karma. 
She spat out between fits of laughter. It's a sign from above, a sign that the empire is destined to change for the better. You traitor, General Budo seethed, his voice low and dangerous as electric sparks began to form in his fist. Annie stood her ground, undaunted. I am not a traitor, she replied, her voice rising to match his anger. I am a patriot who loves this empire more than you ever w. Bang. A sudden flash of lightning struck any point blank, the deafening boom drowning out her last words. She fell to the ground, lifeless, her body still smoking from the electric shock. General Budo paused for a moment, his eyes fixated on Annie's lifeless body. He took a deep breath and summoned the guards to enter the room, their footsteps echoing through the now silent chamber. With a commanding voice, Budo issued a series of orders to the guards. Gather all the corpses and display them at the gates of the capital, he said firmly. Let it be known that these were spies against the empire, enemies of the state who met their rightful end. The guards nodded in silent agreement, their faces expressionless as they carried out Budo's orders. They lifted each body with care, one by one, their movements methodical and precise. It was a macabre scene, the lifeless bodies laid out in rows, a gruesome display of the empire's power and ruthlessness. Lastly, Budo continued, lift the lockdown of the capital, but maintain strict security around the palace. He knew that the empire's enemies would see this display and tremble, knowing that they could be next. And with that, he turned and left the chamber, his mind already focused on the battles to come but now his priority is to remain at the emperor's side, and hope for the best for his recovery. 7. Chapter 5. As he hungrily devoured a turkey leg, the prime minister chuckled, nothing beats stress eating. His companions, Saikyu and Kukiai, however, were more refined in their dining, opting to use proper manners befitting their station. Prime Minister, one should enjoy food properly, Saikyu, the Prime Minister's closest ally and assistant, chided gently, swirling his glass of wine. Savor every bite and wash it down with a great glass of wine. I couldn't agree more, added Kukiai, the military officer, who sat tall and slim with shoulder-length hair and a sword at his side. Saikyu, a middle-aged man with slick, dark hair, a Fu Manchu mustache, and wore stylish sleek pair glasses, exuded sophistication and intelligence. Though the prime minister indulged in his vices, Saikyu was the man he trusted to run the country in his stead. Saikyu had established his own private army of assassins with the power granted to him by the prime minister. Some leaders might fear their right-hand man having such a powerful force but not the prime minister. Saikyu's loyalty is unwavering, and he would do anything to ensure the success of the prime minister's goals. On the other hand, Kukiai was an entirely different character. Though he wore the standard imperial uniform with pride, he was an extremely selfish man who sought only his own benefit. Kukiai smuggled empire supplies and sold them on the black market to gain wealth. With the prime minister's support, he was able to slander and falsely accuse generals who dared to defy him. The last few days have taken their toll on me, the prime minister stated, his voice heavy with sarcasm. His two companions, Kuki and Saikyu, exchanged a quick glance but said nothing. They knew the truth, that the prime minister's physique was too strong to be easily tired. His rotund appearance was only a deceptive facade, designed to lull his opponents into a false sense of security. For the prime minister is a man who is a master of the empire's imperial fist-fighting style. Any individual that could reach such a level are monsters in the battlefield. One of them can take out dozens if not hundreds of ordinary individuals. Cookie looked out the window of the chamber and surveyed the multiple imperial troops doing their rounds around the palace. And I thought it was impossible to attack the palace before, now it's even harder to do such a thing, he remarked. Budo is going all out, Saikyu added as he took a sip of his wine. Based on previous reports, it has been quite a few years since Budo personally interrogated someone. The recent lockdown imposed by Budo's martial law had caused quite a stir within the capital. With Budo's troops killing revolutionary members found within the capital itself, most ordinary civilians were on edge. Even though the majority had no ties with the revolutionary army and most of them just wanted to live their life in peace, they were still afraid of being falsely accused. The sight of the multiple bodies hanging outside the gates of the capital, as a result of Budo's handiwork, was a gruesome reminder of the brutal consequences of rebellion. It was a powerful message to all those who dared to challenge the empire. Budo is the least of my problems, Honest stated in annoyance as he chugs a large glass of wine. Besides, Budo's recent action was actually a welcome outcome. He didn't have to personally make any moves, and yet multiple rebel spies were taken out swiftly and effectively. It only proves how much Budo is loyal to the empire and how much he is willing to do to protect it. I say you're talking about the child emperor's health then, Cookie I replied. Yes, Honest replied with a sigh, it has been a few days, 
and the comatose child emperor still hasn't woken up. The imperial doctors had done their best to try and wake him up, but to no avail. The best they could do was to keep the emperor alive. They concluded that it would require a miracle to wake the emperor up. It was an answer that Budo didn't like to hear, which resulted in one doctor dying on the spot. Saikyu, who had been listening quietly, spoke up. Why worry then, Prime Minister? Isn't this an opportunity? Honest smirked and gained a thoughtful look in his eyes. True, multiple ideas did come to my mind. If somehow the child emperor dies, the empire, for the first time in its history, will have no direct heir in the imperial family. It could be very problematic in the beginning, but it is also an incredible opportunity. An opportunity to become emperor, Kukiai added with a smile on his face. Yes, but it wouldn't be that easy to do. The empire has never faced a situation like this before. With no direct heir to the imperial family, multiple nobles who have married into the ruling family in the past will push forward their claim to the throne. It will be a fight for power, and the rebels will take advantage of that chaos. And we cannot forget Budo. He is loyal to the emperor, and if the emperor dies, no one knows where his loyalty will be. Honest stated, there was no love lost between him and Budo. Despite both being officials of the empire, they were enemies through and through. Especially now, each time Honest visited the emperor, Budo would stare at him with his cold and calculating eyes. Right now, Budo has slowly become a more active official, slowly using his authority when he can and backing down when he knows it can't benefit him. He is a problematic enemy in the battlefield and in the imperial court. But the idea of becoming emperor was something he did think greatly about within the recent days, only that doing so would be very hard. One would have to fight multiple fronts at the same time, the nobles outside the capital and revolutionary army beyond the borders. Such a battle could potentially ruin the entire empire completely and Honest did not want to be a ruler of a ruined nation. It was just too problematic to deal with, but he was not also against the idea. Right now, though, being the ruler in the shadows was still something he preferred. You being emperor, now that would be a sight to see, Cookie added, breaking Honest from his thoughts. Anyway, did you know what I heard? Cookie I said teasingly. I have such an interesting information. As Cookie I teased, Psyche grew impatient and asked him to reveal it. Out with it, what do you know? He demanded. Cookie I rolled his eyes and said, easy now, friend. I was only joking. But since you asked, I heard reports that General Hemi and General Nikato had a private meeting with the great general last night. It was said that whatever was discussed made Budo seethe in anger. Honest's curiosity was piqued. Hemi and Nikato, weren't they the newest generals installed into power? Do you have any information on what was discussed? Cookie I shook his head. Unfortunately, no. But whatever it was, I think it's a very interesting information for Budo to get mad. Saiku spoke up. I'll try to see if I can get that information for you, Prime Minister. We have our spies, and I'm sure we can find out what's going on. Hmm. You can try, but Budo, Hemi, and Nikato would be tight-lipped about it. Instead, I need you to do something more important for me. Contact my son and tell him to immediately return to the Empire as soon as possible. His time outside the Empire will have to be cut short. He might prove useful during this time, Honest replied as he served himself more food. Saiku nodded in agreement, I will do it right away, Prime Minister. 6. Chapter 6. Deep within the capital, hidden beneath a seemingly ordinary bookstore, lay a secret safe house of the Revolutionary Army mostly used by night raid members. And within its confines, a man could be found slumped over and extremely drunk, tears streaming down his face as he clutched tightly his liquor bottle. His incoherent mutterings were barely audible to anyone but himself. The room was cluttered with empty bottles, a testament to the man's days-long drinking binge. The man was none other than Ben, a valuable member of the Revolutionary Army's intelligence unit based in the capital. He was also a close friend of Annie and aside from her, the only people who knew his true identity were Night Raid and the Revolutionary Army's higher-ups. The recent events had taken a heavy toll on him. After a young and naive member had fallen prey to Budo's ploy, several of their spy networks were exposed, and numerous spies were killed. Flashback. Fool. He's doomed us all. Why didn't he listen? I told them to stay low-key. Ben exclaimed, fear evident in his voice. Guards were seen running all around the capital, storming houses of suspected spies. The piercing screams of multiple individuals occasionally filled the air, some even begged for mercy as they were being dragged to no doubt a gruesome fate. Never mind that now, Ben. You need to hide, Annie said, pulling Ben away from the window. She removed a rag from the floor, revealing a hidden compartment. Listen to me, Ben. 
No matter what happens, you must not leave this room, and he stated with a serious tone. The loss of human spies was one thing, but if Ben was caught or killed, it would completely decimate their intelligence gathering ability. As long as Ben survived, the revolutionary army had a chance to recover. But what about you? We could hide here together, Ben stammered. Annie's words were firm and unwavering. I can't do that, Ben. Sooner or later, someone will reveal my identity in this location to the soldiers. Aside from Night Raid and the revolutionary higher-ups, no one knows your identity. The members of our spy network only know that someone can control rodent-type danger beasts. It's done that way to prevent your death. You are the centerpiece of this operation. As long as you're alive, we can rebuild our structure inside the capital. It might take longer, but it's possible. As the only person who knows your identity, it's my responsibility to keep you safe. But you will die. Ben exclaimed, wide-eyed. Annie gave a weak smile and said, I took this job knowing that I could die. I have fully accepted that fate. She then quickly pushed Ben towards the hidden compartment and said, When our allies break, they will point to this place and I will take the blame so that the soldiers will stop searching. You must not leave this place until a member of Night Raid personally comes to pick you up. There are supplies here for you to live off of for a few days. Do you understand me? Ben could only nod in response. Take care, Ben. Know that we're doing this for the new empire. An empire where the people have power and a chance for a better life. Also, don't get too drunk that you'll die from alcohol poisoning, Annie said sarcastically, with a smile on her face. She knew that Leon had stored multiple bottles of alcohol inside the hideout, and with everything that had happened. Annie knew that Ben would start drinking due to the trauma of it all. Survivor's guilt could be a damaging thing, after all. Annie closed the compartment and used the rug to hide the passage. She arranged the store properly, making it look like business as usual. She stood behind the reception counter and waited for her eventual capture. Fully aware that she had just sacrificed her life to keep the Revolutionary Army's intelligence unit alive. Return to present. Ben's muttering suddenly stopped when he noticed the compartment door opening. He slowly lifted his head and stared at the individual walking towards him. Looks like someone has way too much to drink. I'm gonna have to bill you for that, Leon stated jokingly as she walked down the compartment and scanned Ben with multiple alcohol bottles near him. We need to hurry, Leon. Now that we have found Ben, we need to get out of here, mine shouted from the top floor of the bookstore. The bookstore was used by Lubbock as his cover in the capital, but after a spy was captured there. All documents pointed to Lubbock as the owner which in turn made him a suspected spy, resulting in his wanted poster being plastered everywhere. Now this also had the unfortunate result of reducing the number of night raid members that can enter the capital to two, which are Leon and mine. Nagenda had been anticipating this moment ever since Leon reported seeing multiple bodies hanging at the gates of the capital. As soon as they received word that the lockdown had been lifted, she knew that the situation was dire. After confirming that Ben had not been among the casualties, she immediately assigned Mine and Leon to form a team and locate him. Stand up, Ben, we need to move. Nagenda told us to pick you up and get you out of here, Leon stated, trying to lift Ben up, but he immediately pushed her away. I am not leaving. I have a job to finish, Ben stated with anger in his voice. He tried to stand up but was too drunk to keep himself steady on his feet, causing him to fall back down to the floor. Oh, boy, Leon muttered. She understood what Ben was going through, but now was not the time to have a pity party. They didn't want to be discovered in the bookstore, as that might blow their cover with the Empire. Every minute they stayed in the bookstore was dangerous. What do you mean you're not leaving? Leon asked. I will gather information for the Revolutionary Army within the capital. You guys being here just means that the lockdown has been lifted, and I can resume doing my job, and that also means I leave this place. Ben slurred drunkenly as he tried to pick himself up. Listen, Ben, Leon said, her voice calm yet urgent. We're here to help you, but we need to go now. If we stay here, we're putting ourselves and everyone else in danger. Do you want the sacrifices of all those people who died to be in vain? What about Annie? Do you want her suffering to mean nothing? With the mention of Annie's name, Ben's eyes filled with tears, and he stared at the floor. I warned them, he muttered. I know you did, Ben, Leon replied, her tone softening. She put a hand on his shoulder but then suddenly punched him in the stomach, causing him to lose consciousness. Time was critical, she didn't have extra moments to spare just to fully console Ben. Well, if it works, that's still good, Mine stated with amusement as she saw Leon carry Ben out of the compartment. He's too drunk to move by himself, and staying here for too long is not to my liking, Leon explained as she scanned the surroundings. Seeing that no one was watching them, they immediately left the bookstore and went to the nearest alley. 
deciding that carrying Ben outside the gates would be risky in the middle of the day. The duo rented a room and waited until midnight before attempting to escape the capital. A few hours later, Nagenda asked Leon, how's Ben? He's still sleeping, Leon replied. That's good. I've talked with the higher-ups, and I will personally take Ben to meet them. After a few weeks or half a year at most, they think they can re-establish the intelligence unit, and Ben will be sent out again, Nagenda said as she lit a cigarette. 4. Chapter 7. Well, I never thought I would find myself in this place, surrounded by darkness, all alone in this empty void. I have no idea how long I have been here. It feels like an eternity but who knows really. One moment, I thought I had a bright future ahead of me. I had just graduated from the grueling years of studying mechanical engineering when suddenly COVID-19 struck me. After numerous vaccines, I never thought it could kill me. That was a waste of time to say the least. Before I knew it, I was on my deathbed. That was not how I had imagined my life would end. It's hard to believe that I never got to earn my first salary as an engineer or experience the joys of getting married. I always dreamed of having a boy and a girl, twins. Now, I'll never get to see that dream come true. But, at least my dad was right. Being an insurance advisor himself, he insured all family members and paid the premiums himself. It may not be a massive amount of money, but it will provide my family with a nice nest egg to fall back on. Just as I was about to lose hope and resign myself to this sad fate, I saw a light in the distance. At first, it was faint and weak, as if it could disappear at any moment. But, I couldn't take my eyes off of it. It was the only thing in this void aside from me. It gained my curiosity. With nothing to lose, I decided to follow the light. As I got closer, something strange started to happen. A flood of memories came rushing into my mind, memories of a boy. I watched him grow up, as if I was an observer watching a show. In the beginning, the boy was happy. He had two individuals who were always by his side, I believe they were his parents. But then, tragedy struck. The boy's parents died, and I could feel the weight of his sadness and loneliness. The boy was rich, that was for sure. He was surrounded by multiple maids and guards, but despite their presence, he felt a deep sense of loneliness. If I was there in person, I would hug the child and tell him everything would be okay, but sadly, I wasn't. That all changed when a jolly and rotund man approached the boy. The man's jovial demeanor and wise advice quickly endeared him to the boy, and they became fast friends. As I watched the memories unfold, a feeling of familiarity stirred within me. I couldn't quite place the man's face, but there was something about him that seemed important. Like it was familiar in some way. I just couldn't place it. My own thoughts were abruptly interrupted as I drew closer to the glowing light. Memories of the boy and the man faded away, replaced by a blinding white light that engulfed me. It was as if I was being pulled into a vortex. As I disappeared into the light, a sense of terror gripped me. I tried to pull away, but it was too late. The light swallowed me whole, taking me to a place I know not where. What do you mean you can't wake him up? General Budo, you need to understand. This is not a sickness per se. It's the own body of the emperor that's failing him. Suddenly, I found myself hearing multiple voices. I don't know where they are coming from. I tried to move my body but unlike the void, my body remained still. I could only hear multiple voices surrounding me. One boomed with anger and the rest shivered in fear. You are the most skilled and most expensive doctors found within the empire. Don't tell me you can't save the emperor. A few days ago, the emperor was absolutely healthy. We can't say for sure if the emperor can survive this. We are. What are you doing? Unhand him, General Budo. What are you doing, General? Please, let me, go, A.H. I could suddenly hear a piercing scream throughout my surroundings. It was accompanied by multiple loud sparks of electricity. I could feel my heart race with terror at the unknown occurrence. I was certain someone was being tortured or killed. After what felt like an eternity, the scream subsided, leaving behind an eerie silence that chilled me to the bone. I have warned you before. I told you to do your job. If it requires a miracle to save the emperor, you will provide that said miracle. If the emperor dies, all of you will suffer a fate worse than your colleague. Those were the last words of the booming voice before he disappeared. As I tried to understand the current predicament that I was in, a sense of weakness and exhaustion overtook me. Despite my efforts to fight it, I eventually succumbed to the overwhelming fatigue. I still believe this is a bad idea. To have this quack treat the emperor, how could we fall so low? One voice exclaimed. We have no choice. We did everything we can, if we fail now Budo will kill us all as well as our families, another voice replied, the desperation palpable in his tone. With the child emperor being the only direct line to the imperial family, Budo doesn't want the line to end. 
This is the only way. Stylish, I mean Dr. Stylish is our last hope, to ensure our safety from the Buddha wrath, a third voice interjected. I suddenly found myself in the dark space once again, I could only hear the multiple voices in the distance. Their brokenness and despair could clearly be heard in the tone of each of their voices. Oh my, esteemed doctors in the field, a man spoke with pride and amusement, I like the look on your faces. It has been years since we last spoke, and I still remember you bunch ridiculing my skills and talent. But look at you now, begging me to save you. Dr. Stylish, would you please continue the procedure, one of the doctors interrupted, clearly impatient and annoyed. Of course, doctors, Dr. Stylish replied smoothly. There was a pause in my surroundings, and then I heard multiple steps coming towards me. Suddenly, I felt an injection somewhere in my body, and within a few seconds, I felt a burning sensation coursing through me. The emperor's vitals are spiking. What have you done? One of the doctors exclaimed in alarm. Trust the process. I'm waking the emperor up, Dr. Stylish said calmly. The pain continued to course through my body, growing more and more intense with each passing moment. I wanted to scream and ask for help, but I found myself powerless to do so. Shit. The vitals are falling. Budo's gonna kill us all. As I was about to lose consciousness, I suddenly saw the same white light in front of me that I had seen in the void. It burst with might, engulfing me. The vitals are normalizing. How? The emperor is opening his eyes. I opened my eyes and saw four people surrounding me. Three of them had a look of relief on their faces, while the last one had a smirk on his face as he looked at me. The room was quite large, and I could see that both my arms were connected to multiple medical apparatuses. How do you feel, your majesty? One of the four individuals asked, approaching me with a stethoscope in his hand. What the heck is going on? I thought, confused and disoriented as they checked me thoroughly. 4. Chapter 8. It has been a few days since I found myself in the body of child Emperor Makoto in the Akane G.A. Kill world. The initial shock of this sudden change took a while to wear off, but spending most of my time alone in my room helped me cope. It wasn't that I couldn't leave, it's just that the doctors advised me to remain in bed and heal up, and General Budo urged me to follow their instructions. As the days passed, I realized that the memories I had found in the void were that of the child emperor. I'm grateful to be alive but being in the Akane G.A. Kill world wasn't exactly my first choice. If I had been given the option, I would have preferred a slice of life anime or fairy tale, mostly because of Urza, but that's beside the point. I have met with three people who I remember from the show, Great General Budo, Prime Minister Honest, and Dr. Stylish. All I can say is that they look similar to their anime counterparts, but not exactly a perfect carbon copy. It was quite an interesting experience to be had. Dr. Stylish, in particular, couldn't stop bragging that it was his medicine that helped wake up the emperor. He brags about it quite often in front of my doctors and seems to relish in their defeat. Something I knew wasn't quite the true. I know it was that light that brought me out of the lock-in syndrome I was experiencing while I was already in the body of the child emperor. No wonder I could hear them on occasion. I was conscious back then, but I couldn't move my body nor open my eyes. Perhaps it was a mixture of that final burst of light and stylish drug that resulted in me being fully conscious, but who knows really. In the last few days, I have often found myself contemplating why that burst of light brought me here. Perhaps it was a benevolent force that wanted me to have a better life, or maybe it wanted me to fix the empire's problems. The latter of which is going to be quite an undertaking, as I now find myself in the midst of rebellions, corruption, and political struggles that I must navigate in order to restore the empire to its former glory. The Prime Minister, in particular, is at the top of my list of priorities that I must take care of if I am to succeed. It's intriguing to see how the Prime Minister operates. In the memories of the Child Emperor, Honest is a good man who helped him in moments of loneliness. But now that I know the truth, I can see that the Prime Minister is an expert at manipulation. He can play the role of a trustworthy ally in one moment and then stab you in the back for power in the next. It's likely that the previous emperor and empress died because they trusted the prime minister too much and failed to see through his facade. As I lay in bed, contemplating my next moves, I couldn't help but feel overwhelmed. How could I, a fresh graduate, possibly navigate this complex world of politics and power struggles? Besides the internal problems of the empire, there was also the revolutionary army that I needed to worry about. As a man of the 21st century, I know their cause is justified. The empire is just too corrupt now for ordinary citizens to have a good life. Addressing this issue is one of my top priorities, and I need to find a way to balance the needs of the people with the stability of the government. What a mess, I told myself as I looked at the notebook in my hand. 
The notebook contains all the things I remember from the Akane GA Kill world. While resting, I had also written things down in English for security reasons. I have to thank the memories of Emperor Makoto, without which I wouldn't be able to function in this world. The language barrier alone would have hindered me from taking any actions. I was suddenly taken out of my own musing when I heard a knock at my door. Excuse me, your majesty. I brought your breakfast. Come on in, I replied. The door to my room opened and I could see a beautiful girl carrying a tray of food with her. She was dressed like those traditional maid servants attire of the British nobility of the past. It consisted of a white blouse with a high neckline and long sleeves, a black skirt that fell just above the ankles, and sensible black shoes. Her hair was pulled back into a tight bun. Accompanying the maid was a physician and two imperial guards, the latter monitoring both the maid and the physician for any sudden threats to my person. I brought eggs, bacon, and bread, your majesty, the maid said as she placed the tray of food on my bed. Thank you, I replied as I looked at the food before me. It was a stack of golden brown toast, a perfectly cooked sunny side up egg, and a pile of crispy bacon. I took a bite of the toast, savoring the crunch of the crust and the soft, buttery center. The eggs were cooked to perfection, with a runny yolk that mixed perfectly with the bacon. And the bacon was crisp and salty, just the way I liked it. Damn, the food here truly tastes great. Being the child emperor truly has its perks sometimes. Your majesty, you need to take this medicine after finishing your meal. It contains vitamins that will help strengthen your body, the doctor stated as he placed a small container of pills on my tray of food. Thank you, doctor. I will make sure to take them, I replied with a smile feeling grateful for the care that I received since I woke up. The void had made me appreciate the simple things in life, such as a good meal and proper medical attention. Please tell my compliments to the chef. The maid gave a smile and replied, he would be happy to hear your praise, your majesty. After taking my medicine and finishing my meal, I stood up from my bed and walked towards the window. From there, I could see the bustling capital with its numerous houses and people going about their daily lives. I realized that every decision I make could impact them, either positively or negatively. Looking up, I saw the clear blue sky and let out a sigh. This life is not about me anymore. Somehow, I have found myself in a world where I have to bear a heavy responsibility even if I like it or not. With a sense of determination, I told myself, I don't know where you are, child emperor, but I vow to keep this empire from falling with everything I have. I will change our fate and ensure that the legacy of Emperor Makoto lives on for another 1000 years. I will become the new Emperor Makoto and secure your place in history. 7. Chapter 9. Your Majesty, you should be resting, General Budo stated in a stern tone as he approached the young emperor with quickened steps. I'm just getting some fresh air, General Budo, I replied, taking in the sight of the meticulously designed garden. Moments before, I had slipped out of my chambers and made my way to the palace gardens. The guards stationed outside my room had tried to stop me, but I had used my authority to overrule them. Worried about my safety, they quickly alerted General Budo, their superior, of my movements. As I looked around, I saw that the guards were stationed in strategic locations throughout the area, keeping a watchful eye on me. They were dressed in full armor, weapons at the ready, ready to protect me at a moment's notice. Despite the serious nature of the guards' presence, the garden itself was peaceful and serene. The air was filled with the sweet fragrance of blooming flowers, and the sound of rustling leaves was calming. The garden was truly a masterpiece, with perfectly trimmed hedges and neatly arranged flower beds. A large fountain sat at the center, surrounded by marble statues of mythological figures. The garden seemed to stretch on forever, with winding paths leading to different areas, each offering a unique view. I strolled down one of these paths, admiring the beauty around me. It was a welcome change from the confines of my room, and I was grateful for the opportunity to explore the palace grounds. I never got the chance to ask you about it, but I heard you've been quite busy lately, I said as I picked up one of the flowers and breathed in its sweet scent. I want to thank you for your service to the Empire, General. As a general, it's my duty to root out spies and protect the Empire, Budo replied. I'd like you to update me on the current state of the government. While I was indisposed, as I watched Budo's brow narrow in response to my question, I couldn't help but wonder what he was thinking. The previous Makoto had never asked the general about government affairs that had always been the prime minister's domain. Perhaps Budo found my inquiry odd given our past interactions. However, the truth was that I had already tried to discuss the matter with the prime minister, hoping to appear as the old Makoto, but he always dismissed my questions and told me to rest. This dismissal did not sit well with me, which was why I had turned to Budo for answers. The ministers are currently on a break, your majesty, Budo replied. 
They were in the middle of discussing next year's annual budget when they heard the news of your collapse. They decided to postpone their meeting until you have recovered and are able to give your royal assent. Without it, they saw their meeting as pointless. I nodded, taking in this information. In my previous life, royal assent was a typical process done by constitutional monarchies, and it was mostly a ceremonial process. However, in this world, things were a little different. In this world, it would seem that monarchs had more authority compared to the monarchies of Earth. Without the royal assent no decisions of the ministers can be legalized. It was something the emperors of the past had used to control the government of the empire. Anything else? I asked, noticing a brief moment of annoyance on Budo's face. They also had an unofficial meeting where they wrote a petition ordering the removal of the lockdown of the capital, Budo replied, his anger briefly escaping his control. They threaten you? I asked, raising an eyebrow. Budo was not one to back down from a challenge, so the news surprised me. I am a general of the empire, like my father before me and his father before him. It has been passed down from generations that interfering with the government is not ideal. It shows that the empire is not united, and they were also threatening the entire budget of the military, something I could not allow, Budo stated firmly, his voice laced with anger. I see. Based on the anime, it is apparent that Budo is a true patriot, committed to the cause of the empire. This is likely the main reason why he chose not to act until it was too late. He probably believed that the empire could still save itself without his interference. If he had acted, it would have shown that the military was starting to have second thoughts about the government, and this could have weakened the empire's unity. It's important to understand that Budo is not just a single man. He comes from a well-respected military family and has climbed the ranks to become the one and only great general of the empire. His influence encompasses the entire military force of the empire. If he were to personally speak out against the government, it would not just be him but the entire military speaking. It would show a massive disunity between different branches of the empire, which could lead to chaos and instability. Budo understands the importance of maintaining unity and loyalty to the empire. He knows that his actions could have far-reaching consequences and is careful not to act in haste. Despite his frustrations with the government, he remains dedicated to his duty as a military leader and protector of the empire. They forced your hand, I replied as I threw the flower I was holding towards the fountain. You know, I dreamed of my parents when I was comatose, I lied. I needed to think of a way to justify my recent change in personality. Since I was just recently in a coma, what better way than to pretend that I saw my dead parents? Not only that, I can make predictions based on what I know will happen, and use my deceased parents as an excuse. For example, I could say that my parents told me that this general will join the revolutionary army, or that this person is a spy for the prime minister. By framing it in this way, it will be more believable and Budo would likely trust my decisions in the future. In this way, I not only have Budo's loyalty but also his trust. Although telling this lie to Budo might have its immediate challenges, but I believe that in the long run, it will be worth it. They told me I was doing everything wrong, tell me general, am I failing as an emperor? Budo's face was filled with shock, confusion, and doubt as he heard the emperor's claim about talking to his dead parents. He knew that such a statement could lead to people questioning the young ruler's sanity, which could be disastrous for the stability of an already tumultuous empire. However, Budo chose not to address the matter directly and stated, you are young, your majesty. It's understandable for you to make mistakes. So my parents were right, I replied, feigning sadness. Budo's answer was not direct, but I knew what he implied. He greatly disapproved of the previous Emperor Makoto's ways, especially his close relationship with the Prime Minister. Observing my state, Budo sighed and stated, everything can still be fixed, your majesty. We have not yet reached the point of no return. I understand, I stated firmly, meeting the great general's gaze, my parents also revealed to me how they met their untimely end. Budo's expression showed a clear discomfort with the topic, urging me to rest instead. Perhaps it would be best if you retire to your chambers, your majesty. I will ensure your safety and accompany you. While Budo's intentions were undoubtedly to maintain unity within the empire, I couldn't concern myself with that at the moment. Over the past few days, I had been contemplating how to rectify the state of the empire. Initially, I entertained the idea of delaying the killing of the prime minister. I thought about gathering all potential threats, including the prime minister's son and his death, and eliminating them all in one decisive blow. However, the more I pondered upon it, the more I realized the inherent flaws in that plan. It could lead to unpredictable outcomes, such as the prime minister evading capture and further causing problems in the future. This was a situation I absolutely wanted to avoid. In order to address this issue, 
I needed Budo's assistance. What better way to motivate him to take action against the Prime Minister than by revealing the truth behind the deaths of the previous Emperor and Empress? They informed me that they were killed by the current Prime Minister, I disclosed with a flat tone, laying the truth bare. Budo was clearly shocked at what I said, his gaze intensified, as if he was carefully assessing the veracity of my words. Budo, you are hereby ordered to capture the Prime Minister and all his subordinates within the capital. Just keep in mind that the Prime Minister is in possession of a taiga that can destroy other taigu, I declared resolutely. As I started walking back to my chambers, I added, dead or alive, the Prime Minister must be captured, and I want it done within 24 hours. I want to find out if Budo supports me in this world, even though it may seem unbelievable that I claim to have seen my deceased parents. This is also a test for him. Will he follow my instructions, or will I, as the new Makoto, once again become a puppet ruler under someone else's control? 6. Chapter 10 After escorting the emperor back to his chambers and reinforcing the security in the palace even further, Budo made his way back to the military barracks. The salutes from the soldiers along the way went unnoticed by his preoccupied mind. The words of the emperor echoed incessantly, refusing to leave his thoughts. Seeking solace, he retrieved a dusty bottle of wine from his shelves and took a long swig. Drinking was a rare indulgence for him, especially since assuming the role of the great general of the empire. In fact, he couldn't even recall the last time he had opened the very bottle he now consumed. Hidden within his desk lay a compartment known only to him. Opening it, Budo discovered a collection of classified documents, each containing sensitive information. One document in particular detailed the autopsy reports and analysis of the previous emperor and empress. Such records were a rarity, with only two copies known to exist, the one in Budo's possession and the other held by the former prime minister, Churi. Together, Budo and Churi had tirelessly gathered information, both suspecting foul play in the deaths of the previous rulers. However, when Churi was abruptly ousted from his position, their investigation came to an abrupt halt. Witnessing Churi's fate, Budo chose to silence his own pursuit of truth. His role as the great general was of paramount importance to him, and he feared that any further inquiries could jeopardize his position. He convinced himself that his presence alone ensured the protection of the new emperor, Makoto. Now, hearing the child emperor's claim that his deceased parents communicated with him during his coma, unease settled within Budo's heart. The idea of making significant decisions based solely on the delusions of an ill child felt unsettling. Despite the child being his commanding officer, Budo questioned the command brought before him. Not only that, it would break the rule that his father instilled in him since he became a military officer, the military and the government must not clash. Budo made his way to the window, his eyes scanning the numerous buildings that comprised the imposing military compound. He was a soldier, albeit one with a higher rank, nevertheless, he was a soldier through and through. What right did he have to question the order given by his monarch, his liege? Why does it matter where the information came from? So what if the information came from beyond the grave? Isn't he a soldier? When a monarch tells him to attack, mustn't he attack? Budo stood at the window, rooted in place, lost in deep thought. Unbeknownst to him, the sky had begun to turn yellow, signaling the impending arrival of night. A distant memory suddenly flooded his mind, the memory of his father on his deathbed. The words he spoke echoed in his mind, a final reminder before he took his last breath. The empire is not without its problematic past. As a general, you will find yourself tested through multiple scenarios, but you must always remember one thing, the emperor isn't just a man, he is the embodiment of the empire. The two can never be separated. Remembering those words, Budo took a deep breath, and muttered with a slight smile marking his face, thank you, father. Budo swiftly turned away from the window and approached his desk. He reached for the intercom, pressing the button to connect him with the guards stationed outside his door. His voice carried the weight of his authority as he commanded, Contact all my lieutenants immediately. Instruct them to ensure their soldiers are ready and to gather in my office without delay. As Budo awaited the arrival of his lieutenants, his conviction grew stronger. He made a resolute choice to place his full trust in the emperor, for the emperor and empire can never be separated, they are one and the same. Two hours before dawn broke on the horizon, Budo, accompanied by a small group of elite soldiers, approached the entrance of the prime minister's estate. The Prime Minister's guards were taken aback by the presence of the Great General so early in the morning. They could do nothing but hastily wake up the sleeping Prime Minister and inform him of the General's presence. As Budo's carriage was granted entry, he instructed his soldiers to remain outside the building. Escorted by one of Honest's guards, Budo with documents in one of his hands entered a luxurious living room where the Prime Minister, draped in a bathrobe, awaited him. 
General Budo, please have a seat. Would you like some tea or coffee at this early hour? Honest offered, gesturing to the maid standing nearby, ready to fulfill their needs. That won't be necessary, Prime Minister. I have come here to discuss important matters, Budo stated in a straightforward manner. Sensing Budo's seriousness, Honest dismissed the maids and guards from the room. A tense silence hung in the air as both men locked eyes, neither willing to yield. Why have you come, General Budo? Honest inquired, his voice carrying a hint of seriousness. The early hour and unexpected visit raised the Prime Minister's suspicions. Did you orchestrate the deaths of the previous Empress and Emperor? Budo questioned directly. Caught off guard by the accusation, Honest arched an eyebrow in surprise and responded, What baseless accusation are you making, General? Those are serious allegations leveled against the Emperor's closest confidant. Swiftly, Budo placed the classified documents on the table before the Prime Minister. Observing this, Honest cautiously accepted the documents and meticulously scanned through them, all the while keeping a watchful eye on Budo. As he delved into the contents, his eyes gradually narrowed. Within those pages lay the autopsy reports of the deceased emperor and empress. Internally, Honest was shaken by the gravity of the documents in his hands. He had believed that he had put an end to all investigations into the demise of the former rulers and yet here it was in hands, a file he did not know existed, until now. However, outwardly, he maintained an air of composure, betraying only a look of curiosity directed towards the documents. This doesn't hold any significance, Honest declared, his gaze fixed on Budo's ever-serious countenance. Bang. 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 Suddenly, without any forewarning, a series of thunderous explosions erupted outside the confines of his estate, leaving Honest greatly startled. Simultaneously, an overwhelming sense of dread washed over him, permeating his entire body. With remarkable agility, he swiftly evaded a fierce punch aimed directly at his head. You dare. He seethed, Honest's voice filled with anger and disbelief. His majesty has ordered me to capture you, Budo retorted, his resolve unyielding. With the explosions outside intensifying, the chaos heightened the tension within the room. Honest swiftly retaliated, surprising Budo with his agility and unleashing a flurry of strikes. His movements were fluid and precise, betraying the rotund appearance he had maintained. The room transformed into a whirlwind of fists and agile footwork, the sounds of their blows reverberating through the chaos outside. Their clashes radiated with the power and skill of two warriors who had honed their abilities to perfection. 10. Chapter 11. Bang. Bang, 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 bang. The once peaceful capital now reverberated with the cacophony of gunfire, mortar explosions, and the thunderous roar of artillery cannons. The chaotic symphony roused the city from its slumber, jolting its inhabitants into a disorienting reality. The origin of the explosions became evident, emanating from the opulent district where grand mansions stood as symbols of affluence and power. Witnessing the unfolding chaos, the Imperial Guards sprang into action their adrenaline-fueled steps urging them towards the source of destruction. But their progress was abruptly halted by a formidable blockade of heavily armed military soldiers, their steely gazes fixed upon the approaching guards. None shall enter. An imperial soldier shouted with a gun in his hand. The unexpected confrontation sent shockwaves through the ranks, including Captain Ogre and the steadfast Seri Ubiquitous, whose impulse to break through the blockade was swiftly curbed. Hold your ground, Seriu. These soldiers are part of the Imperial Army. Their orders come from a higher authority, Captain Ogre commanded while restraining Saria's fury. Saria's voice trembled with desperation, her concern for the lives at stake evident in her plea. She stared at the soldiers blocking her path towards the inner part of the capital, but Captain, people could be dying there. We must help. Captain Ogre's voice resonated with a mix of frustration. I understand your concerns, Saria, but we can't do anything about this. As much as it pains me to say this, we lack the authority to command the soldiers blocking our path. Our priority now is to restore calm and protect the lives of the citizens. Ever since Budo's out-of-the-ordinary behavior, Captain Ogre had been compelled to temporarily stop taking bribes and he had started to perform his role as captain of the Imperial Guards more seriously. He didn't want to be on the receiving end of what seems to be a bloodthirsty general. Especially now, there was no doubt in Ogre's mind that whatever was happening within the capital was Budo's doing. He swiftly directed the Imperial Guards to disperse throughout the capital. With composed authority, he instructed the guards to maintain order and urged the citizens to remain calm, emphasizing the importance of staying within the safety of their homes during such a dangerous time. Meanwhile, in the heart of the chaos, 
the residents of the four Rakshasa demons, notorious as the Prime Minister's ruthless executioners, became a target of relentless assault of both gun firing and cannon barrage resulting in them waking from their deep slumber. The building trembled violently under the fierce attacks. Fear and surprise gripped the four individuals as debris started falling on them. They realized that their current situation was worsened by the fact that the night before, they were too drunk to sleep in their own bedrooms and ended up dozing off in the living room. Tragedy struck swiftly, claiming the life of Mez, her once beautiful face marred by a fatal gunshot wound. Sten, consumed by a surge of anger and disbelief, couldn't contain his outrage. His voice erupted with a mix of fury and desperation, what the hell is going on? Amidst the chaos, Ibera's authoritative voice pierced through the bombardment, cutting through the confusion and instilling a sense of urgency, find cover, you idiots. His words resonated with a command that brooked no argument, compelling his companions to abandon their disoriented state and seek safety amidst the chaos. Fueled by a surge of adrenaline and guided by primal instinct, the group launched themselves into action, propelled by an overwhelming desperation to find safety. In a seamless display of agility, they swiftly sought cover behind the imposing pillars that adorned the opulent estate. The onslaught of attacks persisted, unrelenting in its ferocity. Determined to survive, they crouched low to the ground, their bodies pressed against the cold marble floor. The air crackled with danger as multiple metal projectiles ricocheted through the surroundings, their deadly trajectory inflicting wounds upon the trio. We can't hold out much longer in this shitstorm, Ibera growled through gritted teeth as agony coursed through his veins. A bullet had ricocheted off the wall, tearing through his flesh and leaving a crimson stain upon his shoulder. Sten's voice dripped with anger and desperation, his body marred by numerous wounds. All these bullets will shred us to pieces. We need to leave. Suzuka shouted, agreeing with Sten's assessment. With a shared understanding passing between them in a fleeting glance, the trio propelled themselves forward, their muscles tensing in preparation. Sprinting towards the nearest window, they navigated the treacherous path amidst a barrage of bullets. A.H. 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 Their superhuman speed and durability proved insufficient against the relentless onslaught. Bullets pierced the air, leaving a painful trail of wounds in their wake. With mere seconds to spare, they managed to escape the crumbling estate, narrowly avoiding its impending collapse. Amidst the chaos and swirling dust, the three remaining Rakshasa wasted no time and sprinted away from the capital. As loyal soldiers under the Prime Minister's command, they realized that they would only be targeted if the Prime Minister had lost control of the city. Recognizing the gravity of the situation, their collective decision was unanimous, to flee the capital as swiftly as possible. However, the pursuing soldiers were quick to give chase. Aware of the trio's severe injuries, they saw an opportunity not to be missed. Determined to eliminate any remaining threat, they relentlessly pursued their wounded prey. Meanwhile, within the grand halls of the Prime Minister's mansion, a scene of turmoil and defeat unfolded. Prime Minister Honest, once revered and now battered by numerous injuries, knelt on the cold marble floor. His left hand hung limply, broken and mangled, while a mosaic of bullet wounds adorned his body. Breathing heavily, he locked eyes with the man responsible for his downfall. It's over, Honest, Budo declared, his voice laced with a mixture of triumph and exhaustion. He, too, bore wounds inflicted during their fierce confrontation, albeit not as severe as Honest's. Surrounding them, a circle of imperial soldiers stood, their weapons ominously trained on the fallen prime minister, serving as a stark reminder of his shattered authority. Throughout the intense battle with Budo, Honest racked his brain trying to understand why the child emperor would order his capture. He pondered every possible scenario, and only one thing came to his mind. Honest was certain that the last time he had seen Makoto, he still showed favoritism towards him. Budo's current actions against him were something Honest had never expected Makoto to order. Makoto was supposed to be a naive child, incapable of making decisions on his own. The unfolding events could only point to Budo's manipulation, which infuriated Honest. He never imagined that within a few days, Makoto would develop a stronger allegiance to Budo over himself. With blood in his mouth, Honest glared at Budo and asked, Why didn't you bring your taigu? This question had also been bothering him. No one, not even Honest's trusted right-hand man or his own son, knew that he possessed a taigu capable of destroying other taigus. Budo attacking him without his own taigu was a perplexing anomaly. Not wanting to engage in conversations further, Budo remained silent. He instructed his soldiers to chain up Honest with the use of thick and durable chains in order to prevent any escape. As the soldiers began to bind him, a sense of dread enveloped Honest. It was the unmistakable feeling of impending death. 
He desperately tried to negotiate with the soldiers and even Budo himself, offering them great riches if they would just release him. However, before he could speak further, a soldier quickly and forcefully gagged the Prime Minister's mouth. 7. Chapter 12. As the deafening explosions gradually subsided within the inner parts of the capital, a cacophony of military voices rose throughout the empire. The soldiers were urging the populace to gather at the capital's plaza. The reason behind this urgent call to action was none other than the child emperor wanting to talk to his subjects, an event that caught people off guard. The populace had come to regard the young ruler as an elusive figure, shrouded in mystery. Despite his public coronation a few years ago, the child emperor had retreated from the public eye, refusing to make any appearances. Even during the most celebrated state holidays, speculation about the emperor's conspicuous absence abounded, with most attributing it to the prime minister's firm control over the young monarch. It was an open secret among the capital's residents that the true wielder of power was not the child emperor but the prime minister. Consequently, the majority of their resentment for the poor economic situation of the empire was directed towards the prime minister, rather than the seemingly puppet emperor. However, despite his tender age, some still held disappointment towards the emperor himself, perceiving him as a damn fool for being easily manipulated. Despite this, the crowd was still extremely curious as they went towards the plaza. The prospect of finally witnessing the child emperor's emergence from the shadows stirred a sense of intrigue and apprehension within them. The people wondered if the emperor was going to address all those large explosions happening earlier in the day or was the empire going to shrug it off and think nothing of it. As the dawn broke, painting the horizon with a warm golden hue, the sun cast its gentle rays upon the sprawling plaza. Military soldiers and capital guards took their positions with precision, ensuring order and security amidst the growing gathering. Suddenly, the tension heightened as a convoy of carriages emerged, their wheels rolling along the cobblestone streets. Among them, one carriage stood out, exuding an air of opulence and regality that could only mean it belonged to the emperor himself. Escorted by a formidable contingent of eight mounted guards, the emperor's grand carriage gilded forward with unwavering composure. Four guards took the lead, their steely gazes scanning the surroundings, while another four followed closely behind, ready to defend their young ruler at any cost. Adorned with the resplendent royal banner of the empire, gallantly held aloft by two guards at the front, the golden emblem fluttered in the breeze, exuding an undeniable sense of authority. As the carriages came to a graceful halt at the forefront of the expectant crowd, precisely where the plaza stage was situated, an air of anticipation enveloped the crowd. The door of the emperor's carriage swung open revealing the child monarch. Seeing the emperor scanning the crowd, the people reluctantly bowed their heads in respect, not to him specifically but to his title as emperor. In the minds of the crowd the child emperor was not worth bowing to due to the current state of the empire, the crown had their loyalty but not their respect. On the stage, the emperor motioned for the crowd to quiet down, his hand held high. A microphone was promptly placed in his grasp, amplifying his voice for all to hear. My subjects, I'm sure that you are all worried about the various explosions heard earlier in the day. I am here to tell you that those explosions were done on my orders. Orders that will lead for the empire to heal, the emperor's voice resonated through the air, his words hanging in the silence as the crowd processed the weight of his proclamation. My reign as emperor has not yet reached a decade, and yet the achievements of my ancestors have already been ruined. In the depths of my sorrow over the loss of my father and mother, your former emperor and empress, I have allowed individuals to destroy our once flourishing nation. For this, I extend my deepest and most heartfelt apologies, declared the child emperor. His voice resonated with a resolute yet humble tone, as he gracefully inclined his head towards the assembled crowd. The plaza was filled with a collective gasp of astonishment that rippled through the air, in response to the unprecedented sight of a monarch bowing before their subjects. This humble act stirred a profound mix of shock and surprise, as it had never been witnessed throughout the storied annals of the empire's history. The significance of this moment was instantly recognized, instantly etching this moment as one to be remembered in the chronicles of time. Every single individual present in the plaza, whether they were soldiers, guards, and common folk, could scarcely fathom the sight before them. The emperor, in an act of humility, stood before them and acknowledged his own shortcomings. For a brief moment, the crowd exchanged murmurs and whispers amongst themselves, attempting to comprehend the unprecedented display of their sovereign. However, their conversations were abruptly halted by a commanding voice that reverberated through the surroundings, capturing the attention of all. All eyes turned towards the stage, where an unexpected sight awaited them, leaving them once again stunned. The speaker was none other than the esteemed great general of the empire, General Budo. However, it wasn't just his presence that shocked the crowd. Lying at Budo's feet was the prime minister, 
visibly battered and bloodied. The prime minister's body was bound tightly with thick chains, his mouth gagged to prevent any utterance. Witnessing the prime minister in such a pitiable state rendered the spectators utterly speechless. In their eyes, the prime minister had always been untouchable, the one wielding absolute power within the empire. To see him so thoroughly defeated left the people struggling to comprehend the unfolding events before them. Silence. His imperial majesty has not finished speaking. Budo's voice thundered through the air, commanding the attention of the crowd. It was at this moment that the onlookers finally noticed the wounds adorning Budo's body. Bloodstains marred his form, revealing the toll of a fierce battle. Yet, in comparison to the prime minister's grievous condition, Budo's injury seemed relatively minor. The prime minister, on the other hand, bore the unmistakable marks of multiple bullet wounds. People were even surprised that such a person was still alive and breathing. As the crowd's attention returned to the stage, Makoto's voice resonated with determination. Individuals like the Prime Minister have abused the authority bestowed upon them, draining the life out of our beloved empire. They have selfishly exploited their power for personal gain, and I declare that this shall be tolerated no longer. Upon hearing the Emperor's resolute words, a wave of hope began to swell within the hearts of the onlookers. For far too long, the Empire had turned a blind eye to their struggles, squeezing them dry of them dry of everything they had. The needs and aspirations of the common folk had been ignored for too long, leaving them to endure in silence. However, the child emperor's words breathed new life into their weary hearts, igniting a glimmer of hope for a brighter future. The atmosphere in the plaza transformed as the crowd embraced the emperor's proclamation. The weight of years of oppression and neglect started to lift, replaced by a renewed belief in the possibility of change. The people dared to envision a society where their voices would be heard, where their well-being would be prioritized. One. Chapter 13. Next. In addition to the Prime Minister, a somber procession was dragged before the assembled crowd. A group of individuals, their bodies bruised and battered, stood in front of them, each bearing multiple injuries. These figures were none other than the closest allies of the Prime Minister, whose rise to power had granted them various advantages. Among them stood Saikyu, the Prime Minister's trusted right-hand man, Cookie, a corrupt military official, Yukon, the Prime Minister's favorite sycophant, Dowson the money launderer responsible for the prime minister's ill-gotten gains, and the Kobor brothers, obedient lapdogs serving the prime minister's whims. All the newly captured prisoners gazed down at the prime minister, their faces etched with shock and fear. Each one of them had endured a similar ordeal earlier that morning. In the safety of their residences, Budo's forces had ruthlessly attacked, slaughtering their guards and dragging them into captivity. Initially, a glimmer of hope flickered within them, a belief that the Prime Minister could extricate them from this dire predicament. However, as their eyes met the Prime Minister's gaze, the grim reality of their fate sank in. These individuals, perpetrators of violence themselves, had once enjoyed the taking of lives. Yet now, faced with their own impending demise, tears welled in their eyes. In desperate attempts to plead for mercy, their voices were stifled by gags placed in their mouths, lest their cries be heard by the watching crowd. These individuals standing before you have committed numerous heinous acts. Their crimes include murder, corruption, blackmail, assassination, money laundering, and slavery, among others. Today, they will face the justice of the empire, Makoto declared towards the crowd. As your emperor, I hereby sentence them to death, Makoto proclaimed with unwavering determination. The crowd erupted in excitement and anticipation. Finally, after years of suffering, justice would be served. With the Prime Minister and his allies meeting their demise, the people of the capital would hold a more favorable view of the Emperor. Upon hearing Makoto's command, Budo ordered his soldiers to bring out multiple portable guillotines, one for each prisoner. As the prisoners laid eyes on the devices, desperation filled their hearts, and they began thrashing about in an attempt to escape. However, their attempts were swiftly quashed. The Prime Minister struggled more than the rest, prompting Budo to break his leg to ensure his compliance. One by one, the prisoners' heads were placed in the awaiting guillotines. Tears and fear were evident on their faces, their once protected dignity shattered as snot streamed from their noses. The crowd watched in hushed silence, eagerly awaiting the moment the blade would fall. Amidst the onlooking crowd, Leon wrestled with conflicting emotions. The goal of Night Raid had been to eliminate the Prime Minister and every member associated with him, and each member of Night Raid were prepared to sacrifice their lives for that cause. Yet, here she stood, Witnessing the Prime Minister's execution, doubt crept into her mind. Would the Revolutionary Army still be necessary after this? Their aim had been to create a better empire, but now the Child Emperor was carrying out an act they never imagined he would consider. 
Leon's thoughts were abruptly interrupted by the thunderous cheers that erupted from the crowd. In a split second, the prime minister and his allies met their end. Their lifeless bodies convulsed near the guillotines as their heads were severed from their necks. With one final gaze at the prime minister's corpse, Leon slowly departed from the scene. Everyone's attention remained fixed on the shocking spectacle so much so that neither the military soldiers nor the imperial guards noticed her quietly slipping away into the nearby alley. With the crowd still resounding in cheers, Makoto made his way back to his awaiting carriage. The day's events were far from over for him. Several ministers had already been summoned to convene in the palace before he departed to the plaza. The demise of the prime minister marked just the initial stride toward repairing the empire. As the emperor departed, a wave of unified jubilation swept through the crowd. Long live the emperor! Long live the emperor. Long live the emperor. The chants echoed through the plaza, a fervent declaration of support and reverence for their monarch. An hour had passed, and Makoto found himself in a meeting with the ministers of the empire. Despite the memories of his previous self, he realized he knew very little about the individuals gathered before him. The former Makoto had shown no interest in the other ministers whatsoever. Makoto also knew the minister had likely conspired with the former prime minister for personal gain. However, executing all the ministers would set a dangerous precedent and breed fear among future officials. He desired genuine change for the empire, one that would not label him a dictator. He aimed to establish fairness, justice, and trust, fostering loyalty and collaboration instead of fear and suspicion. A palpable tension filled the room, with each person aware of the recent events that had unfolded merely an hour ago. Nerves ran high as they feared saying anything that might incriminate them as allies of the now ousted prime minister. With silence pervading the chamber, Makoto took the initiative to break the ice. At this moment, there is a vacant position for prime minister. As of now, each of you must appoint a temporary acting prime minister until I decide who will assume the role officially. The ministers exchanged glances, their past inclination to vie for power now overshadowed by fear and uncertainty. Recognizing their hesitance, Makoto decided to allow them time to deliberate amongst themselves. The ministers quickly excused themselves, eager to avoid spending even a moment alone with Makoto. Left alone in the room, he was soon joined by Budo, whom Makoto motioned to take a seat. However, Budo respectfully declined and stood, ready to deliver his report. Forgive me, your majesty, Budo began, his face reflecting anger and frustration, my soldiers were only able to kill three out four members of Honest's four Rakshasa demons. My soldiers are still currently in pursuit of the last remaining member as we speak. Piqued by curiosity, Makoto inquired, who managed to escape. Suzuka, Budo responded, clenching his fist. I see, Makoto replied, his tone thoughtful. His mind drifted back to the anime where Suzuka was also the sole survivor. He wondered if the woman's luck was just that great. 1. 